Ahora voy a presentar el testimonio de un luchador socialista y antirracista de larga trayectoria en Estados Unidos, el compañero Curry Peterson Smith. Hi, Curry. El asesinato de George Floyd se suma a una larga lista de violencia policial racista. ¿Cuáles son las raíces de este racismo institucionalizado? ¿Existe un racismo estructural en Estados Unidos? Yeah, the, the deep roots are really slavery, which serves as the foundation of this country, along with the, um, the theft of the land and the, uh, you know, um, war against native people. I mean, those two wars, the, that, that war that targeted both indigenous peoples and the black population kidnapped from Africa and brought here to serve as the basis for the economy, the foundation. Those are the foundation of this country, and they have never actually stopped. They've entered different phases, but there's never been any kind of resolution to, to that racism that has been central to the project of the United States from the start. It is part, it was part of the settlement of the early colonies. It is written into the Constitution. It has shaped every single aspect of U.S. politics and U.S. society. It has shaped the geographies of every city. And of course, it's shaped the police um, and prisons and the courts. The police departments in this country have their roots in slavery, in um, patrols that were meant to control uh, the, the movement of enslaved black people. Um, that's the origins of the police. And the patrols that continue to this day are about maintaining social control of the black population. So. These things are, are foundational and they remain with us. I think it's really important for people, not only here, but all around the world, to understand that. Desde la esclavitud, el racismo ha sido parte fundamental de la estructura del capitalismo estadounidense. ¿Qué análisis hace sobre esto? ¿Y sobre la relación entre la opresión racial y la estructura de clase en Estados Unidos? So, first of all, of course, um, the whole purpose of slavery is to have an enormous amount of um, free labor, you know, I mean, not free for the laborers, but free for the people in control of the labor. And that was really the basis of um, not only the economy in general, but particular corporations that remain to this day. Um, they have their roots in, in, the, in, in slavery. Even beyond corporations, all kinds of institutions, there are uh, universities that not only the founders themselves owned enslaved people or um, the space for the universities come from plantations, but uh, the wealth generated by the slave trade actually is the basis for these universities. So for example, Brown University, one of the most prestigious universities in the country, was established by a slave ship captain. He made his money in the slave trade and he established the university. The law school at Harvard University was um, founded by, uh, with an endowment from a family that owned um, plantations in the Caribbean and, uh, and, and, and they owned enslaved people. They made their wealth in slavery and they, they founded the Harvard Law School. So, you know, these are, this isn't ancient history. These are living histories that have their roots, their economic roots in the slave trade. Um, and not only, I mean, it is the case that um, plantation agriculture in particular was um, an enormous basis for the whole U.S. economy at, at, at its founding. Um, so that, that obviously, you know, that, that played a role in the very constitution of the economy that we have. But it's also the case that racism, which was developed in the course of slavery, developed to... Uh, maintain a situation in which a population of laborers is super exploited in a particular way through very explicit violence, racism was necessary to um, carry out that violence and also to justify it ideologically. Uh, and that, that remains with us today. So, so the form of racism institutionally may change. We no longer have formal slavery. Um, there have been several phases. There was the period of slavery, 
There was the Jim Crow era in which there was legal segregation in the United States. There is the era that we currently live in, which people like um, scholars like Michelle Alexander have identified as what she calls the new Jim Crow, an era of mass incarceration in which we see um, racism very acutely played out in the criminal justice system, but really throughout the economy, housing, health disparities in every other way. The racism continues, you know, whatever phase of, um, of uh, form racism took, the racism itself, potentials continued. And again, that was not only, it's played several roles. One is there has been an economic role and there continues to be. If you can explain the that why one section of the workforce should be more exploited than others. That's obviously profitable. People can see an analogy, of course, with the racism directed toward migrant labor, right? There is an understanding here um, that um, migrants from Latin America should be paid less. Um, and that is used to shape the entire labor market. Um, for people who are citizens here, if you complain about your low wages, we can always replace you with immigrants, right? Um, there is a similar dynamic, or there has been historically, and there continues to be a similar dynamic with black labor. Um, there is also, I, I think the key, the key thing, though, um, about racism is that it divides the U.S. working class incredibly effectively. Um, it means that whole sections of the U.S. working class have never truly encountered black people, let alone develop um, meaningful, rich relationships with black people. And on the contrary, um, racism in the United States operates in a way such that we are scapegoated for the country's problems. Oh, it would be a great country if only black people weren't ruining it, if only we weren't um, taking social services, if only um, our crime didn't make U.S. cities so unsafe, these cities would be so much better without, without us. Um, that serves as a very powerful tool of division. It means that there are white people who've never been in parts of their own city because they've been told their entire lives to avoid those parts because those parts are dangerous. And if we look at black neighborhoods today, I mean, there's a lot to say about black neighborhoods. They're neighborhoods. People live, people, um, people make social life, there's culture. Um, but they're also sites of state violence where the level of policing is on a scale that is just qualitatively different than in other parts of the society. At the moment, there are uh, sites of concentrated infection with the coronavirus. We know that the black population is being um, infected and I believe dying at a rate that is twice the, the white population. So, and, and, and yet in another part of the same city, it's as though this thing doesn't exist. So that's the, the, the role of racism in the U.S. It's incredibly powerful. It is central to understanding why the United States has become the most powerful country in the world. Um, it's, it's extremely effective at generating wealth and extremely effective at de um, uh, dividing the working class and undermining collective struggle. En el año 2014, luego de los asesinatos de Michael Brown y Eric Garner y las protestas en Ferguson, el movimiento Black Lives Matter tuvo un enorme protagonismo en todo el país. ¿Qué nos podés decir sobre ese movimiento, su evolución y su relación con la situación actual? That's an extremely important question because the, the current wave of uprisings appears to be more widespread, actually, than what happened in 2014. You know, 2014, the protests began um, in a few cities, in particular New York City, where a man named Eric Garner was strangled to death, and um, Ferguson, Missouri, where a uh, teenager, teenage man Michael Brown was, was killed by the police. You know, Ferguson had this uprising that summer of 2014. Um, but, and, and there were protests in solidarity 
um, in several cities. It was actually later when the police officers who killed Eric and Michael faced no consequences. That's when there was a widespread nationwide wave of, of protest. Um, now we have a situation where we have seen the killings and I should say this was sparked in Minneapolis by the murder of George Floyd, but that murder was preceded for weeks prior by other um, high profile um, acts of violence. There was the murder of a um, paramedic named Breonna Taylor in um, Louisville, Kentucky. Um, there was months prior, there was the stalking and murder of a man named Ahmad Arbery in Georgia, a man who was a black man who was jogging, who uh, white racists followed in their truck and they, they w with their guns and they intended to murder him and they did. Um, video of that murder surfaced in the weeks prior to the murder of George Floyd. Um, and finally, those men were um, were, were uh, arrested. They faced some. They began the the process began um, uh, of some consequence. Um, so we're at the beginning, actually, because keep in mind when um, large uprisings have happened in the past, whether it was uh, six years ago in twenty four the fall of twenty fourteen. Or actually, in 1992, when there was a um, uh, uprising in Los Angeles, other cities too, but particularly Los Angeles, after um, the beating of a black man named Rodney King, the uprisings were sparked, the, you know, first by the by the incidents themselves, but the larger uprisings came after it was evident that there was no consequences for those um, those, those acts of violence. So. Um, I think that history is really important for understanding what's happening now because what we have is George Floyd was murdered in basically the exact same way as Eric Garner. He was strangled to death in broad daylight in the street in Minneapolis. And his last words, like Eric Garner, were, I can't breathe. And the question is, what has transpired? What's happened between that murder and now? What's happened in the past six years? to make this better. And the truth is it's gotten worse, <laughs> far worse. I mean, it, it's, it's not only did those cops then not see justice, but we have Donald Trump president. You know, he's, he's explicitly given police departments a green light to uh, be more violent. Um, in Baltimore in 2015, after the murder of Freddie Gray um, by, by Baltimore police, there was a small, small response from the federal government. You know, they, they wrote a report. Um, they identified that there was racism in the Baltimore Police Department, and they uh, issued some recommendations. So this is a, a minor, minor response. But even that was immediately taken away when Trump got into office. The, the Department of Justice under Trump said, no problem, never mind. Um, so, you know, the, the people who are fighting in cities across the country now have seen the complete lack of attention to the racism and violence that, that we called attention to six years ago. Um, and I think that this is important because what we are hearing are, are calls to, um, for, I mean, of course, the right wing says we have no right to be on the streets at all. But there are liberals who say, well, I agree with you, but you're going about things the wrong way. If only you could protest in a way that was less violent. And my question is, what evidence have we been given that any official channels to address this kind of racism are effective? It's the very opposite. We've seen not only the ineffectiveness, the disinterest in the official channels, We've also, what happened when Minneapolis rose up last week? The officer who killed George Floyd was arrested. <laughs> so, so, so let's look at this logically. When we fight in the way that we're doing, we get results. Para finalizar, ¿qué análisis haces de la rebelión actual? ¿Qué relación tiene con el contexto más general de la lucha de clases en Estados Unidos y en el mundo? You know, 
it, it's 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 funny because um, the United States, uh, relative to classroom and other countries, it can feel um, quite docile. You know, we look at what um, those of us who are radicals, you know, those of us who are concerned with with social justice. We look to the ways that um, our comrades uh, have been fighting in Chile um, or in Puerto Rico um, or the ways that um, workers in France or Spain are quick to go on strike when uh, there's an attack on pensions or things like that. Um, and in the United States, there's such uh, an incredible level of exploitation with relative resistance. And then moments like this, our militancy jumps far ahead <laughs> of where it, it's been in other countries, right? You know, I talk to comrades in Europe and they say, whoa, <laughs> you're protesting in ways that we don't, right? And that's the, the United States, it's, it's, Resistance tends to be explosive, um, and I think that's for, for, for many reasons. But we can look at the current situation. Um, you know, many of the people who are on the streets in cities today, I mean, you, you think the, the, these protests are actually quite multiracial, which I want to talk about as well. But of course, black people are leading them. They're at the center of them. And, you know, these same people who are, who are rebelling today have been in disproportionate no, disproportionate numbers caring for the sick uh, infected with coronavirus. You know, um, we know that black people have have so little in terms of access to health care. I mean, the, the, truthfully, the crisis of the coronavirus in the United States is it's a total catastrophe. I mean, 100,000 people have died in, in, in this country, the, the wealthiest and most resourced country in the world. So it's, it's, a, it's been a nightmare for the whole population. But black people in particular, you know, it's not just that we, we have less access to health care. It's not just that because of that, we were less healthy before the virus and therefore more susceptible to it. But there are all these stories of black people going to the hospital with symptoms and being turned away, um, told, oh, you're not really sick. Um, we're not going to test you. And then coming back when it's acute and then dying. So that's what these same people who are fighting now have been experiencing for weeks on end. These same people in disproportionate numbers have jobs where we cannot work from home. You know, you work in the service sector where you have to show up to work in a warehouse or at a fast food restaurant with little protection, you know, or bus drivers. The number of, of bus drivers dying right now is, is very, it's high. It, it needs a disproportionately black people. So these, this is what people have been dealing with for weeks before the revolt. And, and it's why it's important to understand, of course, we're angry about the murder of George Floyd, but it's all these other things as well. Um, and uh, to answer your question about what it means uh, about the United States on the world stage, you know, the U.S. Um, for, for, the, for a century <laughs> has cast itself as the leader of the free world. And... Um, that image has been undermined internally from Black Revolt. In the 1960s, when it was the United States against the Soviet Union and the U.S. is supposedly standing for democracy, you know, it, Black Revolt exposed the fact that there, this is not a democracy, actually. Um, so I, I think that there's going to be a similar dynamic. I mean, this is... This is um, this is really sparking, truthfully, there's been a political, um, uh, there's been a, a crisis of confidence in the political system in this country for a long time. The approval rating uh, for Congress is low. 
the approval rating for the president is low. Um, and, you know, we see a president who is doing all kinds of illegal things, and that's horrifying, but the lack of accountability is also horrifying. You know, if Congress is supposed to stop the president, it's not. If the Supreme Court is supposed to stop the president, it's not. And so this is, this is, there's been a crisis here, and now that crisis is more acute. Of course, this is happening in Donald Trump's United States, but where did the revolt happen? Where did it start? In Minneapolis, which is a city run by the Democratic Party. It's, where is it strong? In New York City, run by the Democratic Party. Um, and the response has not been very different, <laughs> you know, regardless of whether it's a Democrat or Republican who is in power. I mean, Trump is saying that um, that we should be shot by the military. But in New York City, run by a Democratic mayor, uh, Bill de Blasio, the New York Police Department, one of the most notorious police departments in the country, attacked protesters by driving cars into the crowds. And the mayor defended the police. So, you know, this is, this is it's, it's, it's going to have major political uh, consequences uh, in this country. And then, of course, whatever happens in this country affects the whole world. Um, and let me say this, uh, I'm, um, I'm an anti-imperialist. I, for me, my politics, my worldview were shaped by revolt outside of this country. It was shaped by the Palestinian freedom struggle. It was shaped by the um, ongoing struggle um, against colonization in Puerto Rico um, it, and, and many other uh, places around the world. And what I have tried to do to be in solidarity with comrades elsewhere is commit to a knowledge of the histories um, of of people <laughs> around the world, you know. Um, there's a, a black revolutionary named Asada Shakur. She was part of the Black Panthers. And in her incredible autobiography, she describes the experience of meeting comrades from Puerto Rico um, and realizing that you can't understand people and their struggle unless you learn their history from them, unless you come to know who their heroes are. Um, and I've taken that to heart. And what I, what I hope comrades around the world will do is the same. You, you know, of course there are, um, there are all kinds of images of the United States broadcast to people around the world through television, through movies, you know, they will portray black people in a certain way or, or don't or won't portray us at all. It, people may not know that we're still dealing with the problems of trenchant racism. And what I'm asking you to do is to learn the history of black resistance and the history or the, the, learn the, the reality of anti-black racism in this country, because you, 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 I promise you, you cannot understand the United States if you don't understand the place of the black population in the history of black struggle and its role, its relationship to the class struggle uh, here. Uh, so that, that's what I'll, I'll end with. Muchas gracias, Curry. Seguiremos en contacto.